Welcome everyone. Uh, can everybody hear me at the back also? All right, great. So um, I'm um, a director of computational imaging group at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, but also I'm uh, assistant professor in the departments of computer science and also electrical engineering uh, at WashU. Uh, to kind of get into the stock uh, in a nice and smooth way, I want to ask audience three questions. Okay. The first question is very easy. Uh, who here? knows what is a microscope. All right, I guess most people know a microscope is something very easy. It, uh, it allows us to see structures which are very small, something we can see, and very often it uses uh, visible light, but that's not even a, a requirement for the microscope, right? So the second and third questions are related, but a little more interesting. So I want to ask the audience, who thinks that the future progress of optical microscopes, so the ones using the light, will come exclusively from hardware development. I see somebody hesitating, but maybe, right? Okay, so now on the other hand, okay, who thinks that the future progress in optical microscopy will increasingly rely on algorithms and computation? Okay, so this really means I'm right at the right audience and this will be a nice introduction. Um, and uh, basically I want to start out with this vision of optical microscopy, okay? So the vision is really divided into three parts and uh, the doctoral students have seen a version of the slide, but anyways, the, the first one is that originally when microscopes were started being developed, right, it was more or less a hardware exercise where an engineer would align optics and try to map a three-dimensional point somewhere in space to a two-dimensional plane, either on film or eyepiece so I can look at it, or maybe later on on a digital uh, you know, sensor to record it, okay? So that was the original thing. Now what happened later was suddenly there were all these computers which became available and we could easily use them. Uh, we have one here, I have my laptop, and suddenly it became much more interesting to record the digital image and manipulate it. So that was a whole era of digital image processing. I could highlight things, the noise images, and do basic manipulations on a, on a computer by the first recording digital image and then processing it on the computer, okay? And now I guess most people in this room are, would agree with me that there is a third thing we're moving to, or slowly but surely, going to that direction, where now I record the stuff on the microscope or maybe even other hardware, but now what I do is I don't just take that as an output, but I aggregate it with a lot of other information come from other devices, potentially even other sensing modalities, and produce something maybe more than that I collected from the device. Okay, so this is really the uh, kind of more futuristic vision, but we're getting there. All of us are actually contributing to this effort to go. And my talk really falls into this third scope where we're moving towards advanced inference for optical microscopy. Okay, so this is the direction I want to kind of angle at. But in particular, I'm not going to talk about any optical microscope. I want to talk about one particular type of optical microscope, which is optical tomographic microscope. Okay, so there is nothing fancy in it. It's just like X-ray tomographic regime. I have a volume that I want to image. Everything on the screen will be two-dimensional, but of course it's in reality three-dimensional. What we want to do inside this volume, we have an object. We want to see that object, so what we want to get it. And in fact, what we want, every location inside that volume, I want to know a number, okay? And that number is refractive index at every location in space, okay? It's a complex quantity and I want to know it at every location, okay? So that's really what we want to see. But instead of using X-ray illumination, we want to use coherent illumination, uh, which is basically a laser or something that approximates a laser. And we can model it as a plane wave. It will go through the object, interact with it, and then somewhere in space, I'll have a recording device where I'll record the wave coming out of the object. Now that recording device, of course, could be in transmission, but it could also be in reflection or anywhere else. We can place it and just collect the light coming out. And of course, that light will in fact be complex, 
quantity, so the ones who know electromagnetism, it will be a complex quantity, but moreover, we're gonna record it uh, digitally, so it's gonna be a discrete sampling uh, of that waveform uh, coming out of this thing. And just to give you an example, so if I would look at a 2D plane outside of the object for a, a simple cell structure, so we would see something like that. So you would have an amplitude, you would have a phase, you can see there is some amplitude information and phase information. Now the question is, can we record both amplitude and phase? And in general, no. In general, the only thing camera would record would be the intensity, which would be something like that. Okay, but if you do use interferometry with holography, you can in fact do some uh, digital signal processing and extract also the phase and end up with amplitude and phase. And in fact, I'm gonna keep this a little ambiguous because you can have both formats and I'm gonna refer to the case where we have only amplitude with a common name used in microscopy, which is free epitychographic microscopy, okay? So that means I'm just recording the amplitude, I'm discarding the phase, or actually I'm not collecting the phase. It means the hardware is easier to do. Okay, so this is a measurement that we have. We have illuminations that we have, but actually one measurement will not be enough, so we're gonna change something, and in particular, like in tomography, we change the angle and scan it from a different angle and collect a second measurement. And in fact, we're gonna collect a capital YL measurements and again store it on computer. So if you did collect the amplitude and phase, you're gonna have two L images on your hard drive, half of them coming from amplitude and half coming from the phase. Okay, so that's uh, easy enough. And then there is, there is a something uh, very useful about optical tomography. And I wanna first start out by kind of motivating why is it a nice modality. But then I'll also give you a drawbacks of optical tomography. So there are three real good advantages of optical tomography for practical imaging. The very first one is that it's a really nice way to get both 3D and time information. Okay, so here's you have a sample in three dimensions. At every location you have a refractive index and you can see it also uh, moves around so that gives you also a temporal information about the sample you're looking at. Okay, so the second advantage is that it is quantitative and label free. So label free means I don't need to inject anything inside the cell, all I see is a refractive index and that's what I'm trying to get. And quantitative means that uh, the, me the thing I'm reconstructing is meaningful. So for example, it's like in fact refractive index, it has a physical interpretation. So here you have a HeLa cell which is uh, known and what I plot here is uh, not me, it's Cho et al who plotted. It's basically at every point you have a real part of the refractive index of the HeLa cell. So you have three slices, it's a 3D, and now you have here a, a grade which goes from blue to red, and red is some number and the blue is a lower number, so that's kind of, you get you a quantitative information. And now by looking at it, I know two things. I know the shape, but I also know some information about the material because I know it's refractive index. So it's not qualitative like Mike was uh, saying about traditional MRI, but it is actually quantitative modality. And finally, it is non-ionizing and it's really the advantage over X-ray because we use a visible light. It doesn't grill our cell. So in principle, we can collect more information about the cell, but also it's high resolution, meaning we use uh, optical wavelengths and cells are order of uh, micrometers, but um, uh, illumination in the order of nanometers, okay? So here you have an example with C. elegans acquired at 633 nanometer light illumination, and you can see nice high resolution structures of the cell. Okay, so those are the three advantages, but we also have a drawbacks. Optical tomography is very challenging modality to get used in practice. And let me list like three explicitly uh, limitations. So first one is that acquisition is actually quite lengthy, which limits the 3D plus time idea. So we want it to be 3D plus time, but it's limited. Let me show you an example. So this uh, setup comes from a collaborator of mine, Leitian. So you can see there's a microcontroller and then we have a LED, LED array. You can illuminate the light. So whenever some light goes on here, basically that light goes to the level where I have the object and you can approximate it as a plane wave and we get back to that modality. I'm gonna collect it underneath and by changing illumination, I can collect multiple measurements of the light at the output of the microscope. So for example, this is a real time performance of this thing. You can see the speed of acquisition, right? And now in, if I wanna get a 3D information about the sample, I really need hundreds or even thousands of illuminations to be able to collect a three, one 3D image. But if I have many 3D images at a time, that will kind of put me, be my bottleneck of acquisition. Okay, and the second limitation is imaging artifacts and they are pretty substantial in, in optical tomography and in particular for two reasons, okay? 
And the first reason is missing information. So you can imagine if I drop the face, that's one source of missing information. But we have another source of missing information. It's we typically, unlike in X-ray, it's very hard to get 180 degree rotation of the source. So we have a lot of frequencies missing, in particular in the optical axis, which is the axis I have my illumination going through the object, okay? So let me elaborate on this a little bit. So it's a combination of two things. So there is missing angle information, but then there is another loss that we incur is because very often we model interaction of light and object linearly. We're gonna talk about it a little more, but these two things combined can get us very scary artifacts. For example, those two images on the top image it's two identical spheres of the same size put in the medium. On the bottom, you have two identical yeast cells of the same size in the medium. The light comes from left and goes measured here and scanned in this way. So you have a lot of missing information along this axis, okay? But the second thing, you model things linearly, which is in fact not true between the interaction of those two beats. So if you form the image with a linear model, you're gonna see the scary thing that one thing is smaller than the other, but we know it's not true, okay? So if you don't correct for it, you might end up with the images which are completely false uh, for the purpose of studying the biology. Okay, and finally the third limitation is the sophisticated optics and this is related, if you really wanna collect the face, you will need to go through interferometry. So there is a big interest in trying to reduce the complexity of optical setup by trying to compensate for it as much as possible. Okay, so those are the three, three drawbacks of uh, this nice modality to study biology and with potential applications in biomedical imaging. So this talk really I wanna go through the way which is actually related to uh, NSF funded project with Lei Tian where we're trying to use computation to overcome those limitations in the optical microscopy. And in particular, we really wanna use the best tools available in signal processing and inference to try to compensate for those things, okay? So the view we have is this of this inference engine where of course we have a sample that we don't know that we wanna get and then there are measurements that we collect, right? And this becomes a typical inverse problem where you have a forward model which basically relates the unknown uh, refractive index distribution F to the measurements of the wave outside of the cell. So that's the first thing. And in fact, in this case, this forward model in reality is nonlinear. And there are two reasons it's nonlinear. The first reason is what uh, Laurent was mentioning before, which he was leveraging, in fact, is the multiple light scattering, which means as li light goes through the object, it gets scattered. I'm gonna mention it again a little bit later, explaining it a little more, but that creates a non-linearity of interaction between light and the object. But even beyond, even that one laner, then there is collection of only intensity, only measurements typically, which creates a second uh, non-linearities in the, in the collection of the object. And this is actually also related to Laurent's talk where he was taking absolute value squared by using the camera. So this is really the, the phenomenon of optical setups. So this would actually not be true if you were thinking of radar because there you have a possibility to collect the, the phase information, okay? Now the second thing we have is we're gonna use inference so we can actually try to embed some prior information. And as we saw, we have a lot of missing information. So any way we can compensate for it by using priors would be beneficial. And there in fact, we need pretty advanced priors to compensate for things. So again, we wanna go again uh, against long acquisition, incomplete measurements, and noisy uh, measurements coming from the artifacts. Okay, so this is a global picture of what we wanna do, and of course we're gonna rely to some uh, signal processing to the rescue. So I divided the stock into three parts, but in fact it's two big parts and one very small part. Okay, so the two big parts, the first part I wanna explain a little bit about the physical modeling of light scattering, in particular related to some of our work done in the past, and this relates how to model multiple light scatterings, this non-linearity and to form images, and combine it with the priors, okay? But that will rely on traditional optimization paradigm, uh, which basically uses sparsity to form the images as a prior, okay? But then I wanna move to second thing, which will be related to one of the things I taught uh, for graduate students, but in fact here I'm gonna present to general audience, which is about trying to go beyond optimization for inf inf enforcing priors. In particular, can we learn some priors and impose them in the, 
in the image formation. And the finally, the third part is a very short but a curious part. Uh, it's something which is recent and it's known as deep image prior and we've been using it a little and I'll get more to it when we get to that stage of the discussion. But for now, I'm gonna get started with the first part of the talk, okay? So why is, um, what really makes optical tomography quite challenging? It's in fact, there are really two things which are there which create some fundamental limits when we look at interaction of the light and the tissue. Okay, the first thing is absorption and the second thing is scattering. And in fact, I have everything here ready to demonstrate it in front of you. I have a red laser and a green laser. So if I actually put a red laser through my finger, you can see the source. So the absorption is pretty low for a high frequency, a uh, uh, big wavelength. Now if I take a green laser, you will not see anything, okay? So this is the same phenomenon. You can see red go through, blue and green don't. So it's wavelength related phenomena of absorption. And that's one of the ways the light penetration is limited in our body into the depth, okay? But there is a second phenomenon. Even if we didn't have absorption, if you look carefully, you don't see clearly the source of light through the finger. Okay, it's kind of diffused away, it's blurry. You don't see where the source is coming from. And this is exactly as a phenomenon of scattering. And let me kind of go through this in three different steps, okay? We all know what happens in the air. So air is a homogeneous object, or maybe in the water. I can perfectly see where light is coming from because in fact, light goes completely straight and there is no scattering, okay? If I put a very weak object, almost nearly transparent, something very close to air, the same phenomena can happen, and then I can basically use the same math from X-ray to form images, because I'm gonna have a straight ray approximation which will be valid, I'm gonna use a radon transform, and I can form the images, okay? Now there is a, another regime, which is a semi-transparent objects, and this is called a, a one way of linearization, and it's known as firstborn approximation. There are variants of that, slightly modified variants, but there you assume that the light goes straight, hits object, but gets scattered one time, okay? Any light ray gets scattered only one time within the object somewhere, and now if you go through the mass by plugging in, and I'll mention it at some moment, you're gonna end up with a weak scattering approximation. And finally, this is a regime we are interested in, where light goes through, gets bounced, bounced again, and bounced multiple times, and this is known as multiple light scattering, and this is what creates nonlinearity, but careful, the nonlinearity is not in the light, it's interaction of the object with the light. Okay, refractive index to the light is nonlinear, but wave equation is linear completely in the wave, but it's just nonlinear in the object. Okay, so then if I kind of divide those two categories in two, we, I'm gonna just mention this, but this is quite known, you're gonna end up with a linear measurement system, which is really at the core of the modern optical tomographs. Okay, they're really based on linear approximations. Uh, you end up with convex algorithms, usual sparsity, everything nice, and you can end up with nice optimization. But on the other hand, once I start putting in uh, multiple scattering, I'm gonna end up with a non-convex problem with something I need to model, and it becomes a little more intricate. Okay, and basically it's a really one of the fundamental limits and this is a very similar image to one uh, Lohan showed. It really limits our ability to see in the depth. It creates this foggy-like effect for us to be able to see deep inside the body by using optical illumination, okay? So let's get uh, with a uh, modeling of this whole phenomenon. So there is input light, there is an object, there is somewhere a sensing plane that we're collecting the measurements. So the first thing we know is that wave equation describes the light interaction. In particular, you can go as complicated as you want, starting from Maxwell's equations or going to a scalar wave model. But here I show you a scalar Helmholtz equation, which actually highlights the linearity. But before going there, what I can do, so what, let me explain what this is. So this is a Laplacian operator, this is wave number number in the com, uh, homogeneous medium, we can know this number in air or in water, where we insert the cells, we know it. Now I have two things, two U's and F. F is what we want, it's a refractive index in space. Now U, you can see there is U equals U in plus U scattered, okay? U in is what I put into the system, I know it. It's plane wave, it goes through the thing. U scattered is a result of interaction of light with the object. If I add them together, I get a total field anywhere in space. So you can see there is almost one-to-one -one relationship between U and U scattered if I know U in, which I assume I know U in. So now you can see this on both sides. There is U scattered here and U here, 
which is basically the complication of the whole affair. And in fact, if I find the Green's function of this operator, so this is a linear operator, I compute, the, I can, it's a known Green's function actually, I can integrate it out and formulate it in the following way. So that's a domain integral formulation. Now you have U scattered here, the Green's function of this operator which inverts it, and I have finally F times U on this side. So it's, both are equivalent. I really didn't gain anything in this formulation, but it's just a little more convenient to highlight one thing. I have U here, I have U here, I have F. So this is nonlinear coupling between F and U. Okay, so this is really the, the deal in this formulation. Now, this U here is what contains the source of multiple scattering. It's a total field inside the object, and I need to integrate it over omega. Okay, now the linear approximation of a single scattering, which is known as firstborn, can be derived the following way. It's very easy. I'm gonna just take U and replace it by U in. I know U in, I don't know U, I'm gonna plug it in and I'm gonna get firstborn approximation and now you can realize it's a linear operator applied to F, which simplifies everything and gives us a nice linear inverse problem. Okay, so this is known as a firstborn approximation. So firstborn approximation really assumes that U scattered is much weaker than U in, which basically means the object is semi-transparent uh, in the approximation. But here's the powerful thing of, about um, single scattering approximation is that it builds our whole intuition about the resolution, about many concepts. And let me just walk you through this because it's very elegant. It comes from the Wolf's 1969 paper and Wolf actually just passed away this year. And some people were even discussing to call the firstborn approximation presented the way I'm gonna present you now as a Wolf transform. So name it after him as a wolf transform. But anyways, so intuition is the following. So if I have a 3D object in a space domain and I look into its frequency domain in 3D, so this is basically a complete 3D FFT of the object in principle. So if I take an illumination and I collect 2D measurement on this side and I take a Fourier transform of this measurement, it's a 2D Fourier transform, Okay, what I'm ending up with, if I admit that approximation, and you can see the math here, I'm gonna end up subsampling the Fourier space along a semisphere. Okay, so this is a semisphere. So if you know X-rays, you know central slice theorem, which says along a line or along a plane, here it's a generalization, it's along a semisphere. Okay, if I have a reflection, it's the same thing, but on the back side. And then basically, if I, admit, I take this linear model, I can discretize the object, plug it in, so then I can really end up with a traditional linear inverse problem formulation, where basically H here corresponds to subsampling in the Fourier space. So it really becomes like tomographic regime, and everything is, is nice and clean. Okay, so now uh, the question is how can we go beyond the linear model? And this is uh, something that I wanna mention. There are several ways to go beyond the uh, linear model and there are several contributions of the, over the years. But I wanna highlight one which I find particularly computationally simple to do and very flexible to implement in many ways. So it's known as a beam propagation model. It was proposed in 1978 by Feit and Fleck. And the idea is very intuitive to explain. So if I have a homogeneous medium, and I have the distance along the optical axis as L in some units, and then I shine the light, I can know perfectly how the light goes through this medium, okay? In fact, if I look at U scattered here and U in here, U scattered will be really the filtering of U in with some known kernel, and that kernel depends on the distance, okay? So this is really propagation in, a, uh, in an empty, I mean, homogeneous space. Now the next question I might ask, what happens if I have a nice plane, so infinitely thin object in the middle? Okay, I have infinitely thin object, I wanna know scatters field, what happens? Well, I know exactly what's the field before the object, so it will be a convolution with L over two kernel. I know exactly what's happening after the object, it will be the same thing, okay? The question is what happens in the object, and basically what happens at the object is gonna be a phase shift. And this is really what scattering from a thin, infinitely thin slice is. It's gonna be a pointwise product between U1, which is here, and then something related to refractive index in one-on-one -on -one basis, and then you're gonna get what's U2, which is right outside, okay? So now if I take this, a thin object can be really approximated very easily. I have a convolution, multiplication, or phase mask, and another convolution, and then I know U scattered. 
Okay, okay, this is great. Can we say something about multiple slices? Okay, so if I have multiple slices, well, I can redo the same thing because I know this thing. I have some delta, which is the size of my discretization. I have propagation in empty space and then multiplication by the slice k of the object. And basically, if I repeat this, I'm gonna get a very nice recursive model for getting a scattered measurement. And this is what's known as beam propagation. Now, I'm omitting all the mathematics of it, but you can actually derive it completely from the Helmholtz equation by taking an approximation, and this is key. There is one thing I'm ignoring here, which are the reflections. Okay, there are no reflections here, but if you accept that there is a multiple scattering going forward, you can take and model it by using the beam propagation model, and then it is valid. You can get more details by looking at Fight and Flex uh, a manuscript about beam propagation. They have several refinements also of beam propagation method. But basically, this is a mechanism. Now, if I discretize it, I'm gonna end up with this recursive equation where I have a filtering by phi, and I have multiplication by the object, and nonlinearity comes from the fact that this OK is basically exponential that depends on the refractive index, and that's really the, 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 the nonlinearity of this whole thing, okay? Field to object nonlinearity. So yeah, so basically this is a thing, and by now taking this thing, you can really design a very simple nonlinear image reconstruction algorithm, which we published um, in 2005, and we misleadingly called it uh, learning approach to optical tomography, and you'll understand why misleadingly. So if I have an object F, which, can, which I divide up the way I just explained you. I put all the pixel sizes, I discretize everything nicely. There is, I collect the measurements. So this is in a computer. This is actual data coming from the microscope, right? What I can do, well, I can simulate knowing the illumination using BPM, a predicted scattered field. I actually get an experimental measurement. I compute the error difference between them. And if you think back, we had a recursive structure which should remind you of neural networks and error back propagation algorithm. So now I can use the chain rule to easily back propagate the error inside the object, and by using it, I can update the image, okay? So it's gonna be very simple and efficient algorithms that you can really use to form images, and by iterating the thing after convergence, you're gonna get uh, an easy way of forming images. So this is BPM, and it turned out to be extremely useful, but before getting into some validations, let me just um, highlight the importance of algorithms when doing image formation with this beam propagation method, okay? So there are two very widely accepted algorithms. There are more, but the two of them are particularly dominant. Uh, there is uh, proximal gradient algorithms, or forward-backward algorithms, or FISTA, which are the accelerated versions, and there are ADMM. Uh, both of them had um, a lot of success in image formation, and in fact, everything kind of comes down. If we look back at the object, what we want is we want to form reconstruct the refractive index by using a data fidelity term. For example, here you have a quadratic, y minus scatters field f, and we know how to compute the gradient of this very efficiently on a GPU by using error back propagation if we need to, okay? Now we have a non-smooth term, so now what we want to do is optimize. Now, the key is, of course, we can define a proximal algorithm, which surprises nobody in this room. Uh, it's basically L2 term plus a non-smooth term, and by plugging into the either ADMM or FISTA, I'm gonna end up with this uh, recursive, easy way of computing. Now, the question I'll have is, which one of them is more efficient to the scheme I just described, okay? So if you think carefully about this problem, and this is a, a nice illustration and a second illustration in this conference because on the first day we had an illustration with quantization where actually ADMM has a drawback just because of the nonlinearity of the forward the model. This is a case where gradient is very efficient to compute, but the proximal of data fidelity is pretty challenging to compute because in fact proximal uh, will have an, uh, has to solve something of this order where R is basically this term. Okay, so you have a proximal of D, and this is a non-convex thing. Even the minimizer might not be unique, which basically complicates this uh, definition of this proximal operator. Okay, so this is kind of uh, algorithmic introduction to beam propagation method, and let me show you some experimental results showing the performance of this thing compared to linear models, right? So here's actually the cost function which is being minimized. I have capital L illuminations, YLs are collected, so here I'm assuming that we have the phase, 
Okay, otherwise I would have absolute value here. But here I'm assuming we have a phase, and in fact everything was collected on a holographic setup where we had both phase and amplitude. Now you have L illuminations, you compare them, this differentiated with uh, arrow back propagation, and then regularization is isotropic total variation uh, regularizer, uh, and we use a proximal gradient method. So here are some results. So the first line here shows you this approach, which you know, was called learning tomography, which does exactly what I explained to you. And then there are two other methods. One is weak approximation with a firstborn approximation. And this is a straight ray. What is straight ray? It just means I assume that the rays go straight. Okay, you can still use it to form images. Now you have three rows and three columns. On the leftmost columns, you collect 81 holograms to reconstruct. On the rightmost, you collect six holograms and the size of the image is 512 by 512 by 512, okay? And hologram is the same size as, a, as an image. So now if you can look, each one is regularized by TV, okay? But what happens is straight ray approximation in this case, actually no, the straight ray approximation was not regularized by TV, let me mention this. So this one was formed by error back, um, uh, error back projection algorithm or filter back projection algorithm. So you can see the artifact in Z. Uh, so this is a, a Z dimensions where is the optical axis will have missing data. You can see it's kind of elongated. This is all missing uh, uh, data information. But the both bottom and the top one are regularized and we optimized the lambda parameter of TV by hand to get the best result. But what you can see is when an am amount of measurements drops to very few, six, no matter how you tune your TV, you'll have to trade off between a very blurry or very noisy image. So this is what you can really see. You really cannot see the features. On the other hand, by using multiple scattering, you actually get a better image. Now, there is an intuitive reason why this is true. In fact, by modeling forward scattering, whatever you would call noise, you're now collecting as information. Okay, things that would be otherwise discarded as noise because of the approximation are now part of the model and give you extra information in the image formation. Okay, there are a little bit better uh, illustrations of the same phenomena. So here you have three beads in different orientation and now this one is a simulation in fact. Uh, I'll show you an experimental next. So in the simulation you can see that if you don't model multiple scattering, you're gonna have this ambiguity between three beads and you have the shape that kind of gets modified. On the other hand, if you use beam propagation, you can get very high resolution, high quality images. And this one is actually perfect for TV. Uh, and, and now here there are two beads, you can see. Uh, no, this one is actually as a, as a, the cells that I showed uh, uh, originally. So you can see if you do a linear approximation, you get all these deformations in a linear case. Now if you use the multiple scattering model, you actually get the, the sizes correctly. And you can correct the artifacts in the image formation. Okay, so this basically uh, closes the first uh, part of the talk that I wanted to give. And what I really wanted to talk about is beam propagation, modeling nonlinearity of the light scattering, and plugging this into large scale optimization to be able to form images. Now, I think I have time. I can actually answer at this moment a very short question if it's not philosophically long, if anybody has one. If not, I'm going to continue. We can go back to this later. Yes? What about the diffraction when you put a thing inside the medium? Thing because you say the beam model is a script line, but what about you put a thing? A sensor inside? Yeah. Yeah, typically you cannot put sensors inside, so oh. you have to put the sensor outside of the object unless you kill the object and you put another, uh, it gets complicated. But uh, so yeah, that, but, but we can get back to this if you want to talk about more. So let me go to the second uh, part of the presentation. So one of the things, right, so total variation is great. It imposes very nice structure. For example, it tells us the object is piecewise constant. Some people say piecewise smooth, depending on the parameter you're gonna pick. But that's a model, it's a pretty powerful model. Now the question is, can we actually impose more sophisticated priors uh, when we're trying to form images? In particular, the question will be, can we put any kinds of priors that give us information beyond simple L1 and L2 norms. In particular, how can we consider putting priors that we learn to, part, to be part of the image formation, right? So this is kind of a question I wanna address in this second part of the presentation. And really, we know by now that um, neural networks 
kind of have been empirically and extensively demonstrated to really yield powerful priors on images. So here's one striking example uh, that at least very striking to me. So this is known as context encoder and it came out in CVPR in 2016. If you take an image, you cut out the middle part, you propagate it through a neural network and then you have a least squares cost and you have a adversarial cost in this thing, you train this whole uh, network in this parameter, what you can end up with is this interpolator, okay? Which is pretty remarkable in many ways. Now, when I was a student, I didn't have this tool. I had Wavelet Transform, and uh, the best I could get was smoothing over this, this page. I couldn't really impose the sophisticated structures that I could e extract from the images. And really, this seems to be one of the promising aspects of using deep learning when we think about image formation under difficult conditions, right? We can really think about very difficult priors, structural priors, and put them in into this. But how do we put them in? Right, so that becomes the next question. I have a neural network architecture, so how do I integrate this to image formation? Now, there have been several papers uh, that dealt with this issue, but very popular approach, and it's extensively popular. There's, it's been applied to MRI, uh, to computerized tomography, it's been applied to image super resolution, to many things, is this very popular data processing pipeline where you have a data, for example, in CT, so this one comes from the paper in 2017 by Jean et al. Uh, by using uh, CNNs for uh, CT image reconstruction. So you do back projection, you get this noisy image, you put a convolutional neural network. Is it useful to back project? Well, that's a very good question. I think the best answer to it, most people back project. <laughs> and I'm sure they tried not to back project. Okay, because they knew that people would ask this question. So basically what back projection seems to give is initial free structure to restructure the data in the way you want and then reconstruct. Now, there is a paper which came out in Nature either this year or last year about MRI which tried to not back project. But I talked to the guy, it seems like he was back projecting from time to time and a few times he was training the back projector. Okay, he just set it up as a fully connected layer and trained it. So yeah, so very good question, but basically rationale seems to be if you have a good denoiser, you have a cheap back projector, get the structure and then denoise the structure. So related question, is your, depending on your, your By the way, it's not my contribution, so yeah. Depending on your measurement, is your back projector uh, onto, or is it, is, it, is it information losing or is it information preserving? So you have to look at the nonlinear operator, but most likely, right, if you look at the null spaces of H and HT, you would get the answer, right? So that would be really the answer, because so far it's a linear. We know exactly what happened in H. Okay, there is noise. So long you're not inverting things, you're getting something, okay? So, so, but this is really not my idea. I wish it was, but it's not. Um, so there is a form of this which is our idea, and you're gonna hear about the talk of my PhD student, Yusan, right after this presentation, okay? So uh, let's go on. So that, what are the key limitations of this approach? So this is now a valid question. So this is a very popular approach. The key advantage of this approach, it's fast, it's extremely fast. One, this is trained. You, you don't even need to implement much. You take TensorFlow, it does all the work for you. You get everything working very easily, okay? That's really the key advantage. But there you get some disadvantages, okay? The first disadvantage that we can probably easily identify is that you're gonna end up with implicit de dependence between the forward model and the prior. What does this mean? So this neural network is internalizing two things. The structure of the noise to compensate, which comes from the forward model, but also the prior which you're giving to train this network, okay? So what, what's the complication of this is now you have this black box in many ways where you don't know which part of it comes from which dependence. So you need to think a little carefully to design a neural network that would have separation. And I would argue explicit separation is beneficial in many respects if you wanna separate priors from the forward model, and that could be an advantage. The second thing, you lose the consistency with measured data. In which sense? So I have to clarify this. You lose it in the following sense. Each time you forward propagate, your forward propagation is not explicitly measuring the, the, the distance between the measurements. Okay, you're really not having that explicit link. On the other hand, when I do optimization, I have this lambda, I control it, so I can control how much data fidelity control I have. Okay, and the third disadvantage is that we need at least a very good starting point to get something out of this. 
Okay, so what do I mean by this is that if in some cases, for example, here's an example. If you think of a nonlinear measurement operator, which has non-trivial structure, how would you even back project very easily? Okay, so that would be uh, another thing to think. In some cases, it's easy. So in CT case, if you have enough measurements, you really end up with a noisy thing and you denoise that image. But you might end up with the problems, and there are a few we, we looked at where uh, back projection becomes a, a challenging aspect in informing the images. Okay, so those are just three examples that I came come up with. This very nowadays popular architecture for image formation. Now, on the other hand, there was an alternative idea which came out in 2013, but not really linked to neural networks, and it came out in two communities, right? So. This paper I'm citing here uh, is known as uh, plug and play uh, formalism and plug and play ADMM. But at around, you know, at the same time, plus minus few years, some people use the same idea for, um, for other family of algorithms known as approximate message passing. So it was applied in, in different ways, but basic idea is the following, is not to, actually the central idea is really to separate the forward model from the prior imposed by the neural network. And it's very heuristic in nature, except in the idealized world of AMP, and I can come down to this if you want, somebody wants to discuss this. But basically, let's say we're gonna build a prior in very naive way. I'm gonna just take noisy images with a Gaussian noise, okay, I add a Gaussian noise, I control the noise as the input, and for each noise level, I'm gonna train at the noiser. Okay, for each noise level, I'm gonna end up one denoiser, and then maybe I'm gonna do a linear interpolation between the noisers if my noise level kind of falls in between those uh, baskets of the noisers, okay? So if you train this thing, I mean, the idea of this, mathematically proximal is a denoiser, well, clear, this is not a proximal, but you can heuristically think, okay, what happens if I use it? So the idea of plug and play was really just to take this, plug it into ADMM, and use it. Okay, so that was the formulation of plug and play. And it really comes from this, but now if you go back to my discussion, one of the disadvantages of ADMM formulation was this part of data fidelity was non-convex. So this original formulation uh, has some drawbacks. On the other hand, it was a misconception at that moment that it will be exclusively restricted. But okay, another thing you can do, and this was our work back in 2017, but this is not the key point of this presentation anyways, the idea is you can now reuse the same thing as with the noiser within a FISTA, because nothing structural in ADMM really says the plug and play has to be special for ADMM. Although there was a form of misconception around this thing, right? So. On the other hand, if you accept this formalism, and you say, look, that's an interesting formalism, let me just use it naively, you can actually see it yields state-of-the-art results in many cases. So the results here are by Romano, Elat, and Milanfar. Uh, it's a paper, Little Engines That Could, Regularization by Denoising, and they did a very nice section on experimentally comparing many algorithms, okay? So I'm going to show you some results. For example, this is an image deblurring where they you know, use total variation and several other methods, and they have a plug and play where the denoiser is a POX uh, trainable reaction, nonlinear reaction diffusion, which is basically a neural network formed by unfolding a gradient descent algorithm. Okay, so Chen and Pox paper, I didn't cite it here, but they basically take it, plug in, and they use it, but you can see remarkable improvements over total variation if you have structured images, okay? Um, you can also look at the others, so here it was average over 10 images. In the papers, they have more results. So really, plug and play uh, uh, leads to very um, interesting results in terms of Im image formation. Now the question becomes, why is it working, right? Can we say anything about the convergence? Does this algorithm make any sense algorithmically, or is it just pure heuristics that ends up working? And some people try to look at this, and I wanted to mention two analysis of plug and play within the context of ADMM, both of them, that came out last year, uh, no, 2016, two years ago, and both came out transactions on computational imaging, one by Sri Hari et al., which was a very interesting paper, because they said that if your denoiser is symmetric matrix with eigenvalues in zero, one, and it has symmetric gradient, then it's a, a valid proximal operator, okay? They, they basically rely on Moro's uh, theorem and that essentially says that your denoiser, if it satisfies these conditions, is an implicit proximal, okay? You don't know the regularization term, 
but it is actually a valid proximal you can use. Every theory of convergence from normal optimization will apply to this scenario, okay? So the noise are be an implicit proximal operator. Now the second result is, uh, is by Chen, Stanley Chen et al. And uh, there the idea was a little different. They tried to weaken the assumption on the denoiser. So the denoiser was assumed to be just a bounded operator. I don't know if I put it, no. So the bounded operator, let me just put the definition for people who might So they said, you know, the noiser has a sigma parameter, depends on the noise level. I'm gonna assume that the denoiser is just bounded, means that any update it's gonna do will be bounded by sigma square. And basically then they show that um, the scheme will converge to some fixed point, and then they use some damping scheme inside to make sure it converges to that fixed point. So that was the Stanley chance result, okay? Now, actually, what you can actually realize by this is both of these papers going some direction of looking into plug and play, but you can take a little more mathematically sophisticated approach by considering convex analysis, and in particular, Krasnoselsky man iteration. So what does this mean? So this is actually comes from our um, um, a manuscript, uh, is that if you actually think of a denoiser as a nonlinear operator, which is not proximal, which is more than a proximal, but which is still restricted to be an averaged operator. Okay, averaged means it's an operator that can be thought as a damped non-expansive operator. And if somebody wants to know more, we can really discuss this in detail. If you take this, then this becomes a traditional Krasnoselsky scheme an iteration. Oh, not this, PNP ISTA, plug and play ISTA becomes a man iteration, which means it will converge, and you can even get the rate of convergence which has now become something interesting, you're gonna basically obtain a result of this form where you have an operator, which is a combination of the gradient on the data fidelity and the denoiser, and if you look at the fixed points of this operator, which basically means all the points, where the denoiser doesn't do anything, oh, the, the P operator doesn't do anything, then the scheme converges with the rate one over T, okay, in terms of quadratic distance. So we don't have anymore an objective function. It's not anymore a proximal operator. We lose any hope of having an objective, but we keep the nice properties of convergence to something which is a fixed point of this operator. What, what does that which operator mean? Average operator means it's a damped non-expansive uh, non operator. And it's better I answer it more in detail, but so non-expansive operator. It's operators that have Lipschitz one, okay? So average operator is this operator combined with identity with some alpha between zero and one. Okay, so there is some details to it, but basically that's an assumption, but here's the critical part. A FIST algorithm that we're all used to can be nicely extended beyond proximal operators, but of course you cannot go very crazily beyond. So there is a range of operators you can expand, and very easy tool is Krasnoselsky man iteration, which is still useful and provide you convergence rates and convergence guarantees, okay? So this is really uh, something which is uh, part of this thing. Uh, and additionally, you can go one step beyond, and this is also part of this work, is now if we look back at our problem, the critical part is that we have many illuminations, okay? Even though we compute the gradient, and gradient is efficiently computed with, um, uh, with the error back propagation algorithm, we still need to compute L of them, which depends linearly on the number of measurements. So the cost of computing this gradient will become the dominant part of everything, right? So the question is, you know, can we accelerate this thing? And here's a simple thing you can do. So we called it plug and play SGD, which is a bad name, but SGD stands for uh, stochastic gradient descent. PNP is plug and play. Uh, it doesn't have a descent condition, so in principle we shouldn't be calling it stochastic gradient descent, it should be stochastic gradient method. But anyway, so that's a name. Um, basically the idea is instead of computing the gradient over the full illuminations L, 
the idea is to compute it over a subset of illuminations, okay, subset B, so that's a mini batch size. So you're gonna compute the gradient over B subset, which is picked IID randomly from the total set of illuminations, and then you're gonna average it, and then you're gonna run the rest as it is, okay? So now if you look at this algorithm, then you can establish this thing, which basically is, says that in expectation, the distance of the iterates generated by this uh, algorithm to the fixed points of that operator. Now, here's the key, this P is not a noisy P, it's an actual operator which uses all the illuminations, okay? Converges to this fixed point or the minimum value over the window T to this fixed point will go down, well, will not go down, but will be dependent to the mini batch size and also on the step size. So this is very related to traditional analysis of SGD and algorithms. In fact, what this means is, if you pick your, for example, your batch size, mini batch size, proportionally to T, okay, and you run it for T iterations, you're gonna have one over square root of T convergence rate, which is traditionally known in the, in the stochastic gradient algorithms. But basically, here's a little illustration of this thing. So you can see three plots, horizontal axis, you have iterations, vertical axis, you just plot, plot this quantity, which is a distance to the fixed point, okay? On the left-hand side, you have 10 mini batch size, 20 mini batch size, and 30 mini batch size. You can see that you have ISTA, so this result is for ISTA, it's not for FISTA, that's important to say. This one assumes that the parameter here, Q, is exactly one at every iteration, so there is no acceleration due to FISTA. We didn't analyze the FISTA case, but in the ISTA regime, you can see that ISTA converges to a value which gets lower and lower as mini batch size grows, and this comes from this relationship, but FISTA also empirically converges, although you know, we cannot have a, an explanation of that algorithm. Okay, so now um, we can, I can show you like some demonstration of this one, but here we're gonna, we applied it to problem of Fourier tachography, which means we have 200 total, I mean, for, like, actually this example, we have 60 illuminations, so this is a simulation on the set of images. We're gonna compare ADMM, FISTA, and PNP SGD. We're gonna plot SNRs, that's why it's a simulation. This allows us to quantitatively illuminate the algorithms. And I basically show you the, the convergence speed of this. You can see the ADMM is the slowest. The reason for that, it needs to invert or compute the proximal, at least approximately in every iteration. And that's a challenging task. Now both uh, FIST and SGD converge much faster. And in particular, uh, PNP SGD expectedly converges faster because per iteration cost is lower, it's six times lower. It uses mini batch size of 10 versus total 60 uh, used in the total FISTA. And uh, here it's a slightly different experiment. So you have several columns here. And basically, it's, here the goal was to look, let's say I have a memory budget of 10 or 30 which means I just gonna process exactly 10 or exactly 30 illuminations. What's the best I can get with batch algorithm versus stochastic algorithm? And here, basically, the whole conclusion, if you look, you can find more details in the manuscript, is that stochastic algorithm gets a good mileage benefit by iterating over more uh, measurements uh, at every iteration. And here, finally, is the experimental measurement collected by uh, my collaborator, Lei Tian. It's from uh, tychographic microscopy. And the experiment is basically to have a fixed budget of uh, 60 illuminations out of total 293. So you have three columns here, okay? Each column, this is no prior reconstruction, this is total variation reconstruction, and this is BM3D used as a prior reconstruction, okay? On the top row, you have a batch algorithm which uses 60 illuminations total. On the bottom, you have three stochastic algorithms which use 60 per iteration. So they cycle through uh, the illuminations at every iteration. Now, here it's blurry because uh, uh, light is a little bit low, but if you see carefully, if you have no regularizer, you're gonna end up with streaking artifacts which create structures on the image. So you're gonna have a vertical streaks, and there's a high resolution image on the PDF uh, of the paper. Now once you put B, uh, total variation, you're gonna end up with different artifacts that are actually blocky. You're gonna have a piecewise constant cell, and it becomes quite clear if you look at it in the 3D by, by 
tilting things and looking at the structure. Now, BM3D, even BM3D, if you use only 60 illuminations, will get artifacts because it doesn't see all the measurements. But finally, if you allow yourself to cycle through more measurements efficiently, you can process more of them and basically get much uh, better reconstruction of the image. Okay, so this basically wraps up the chapter where I'm talking about um, using priors beyond traditional optimization, in particular related to the plug and play framework of uh, Venkat, Wolberg, and Charlie Bauman. Okay, um, and finally, because I have some time, I wanted just to mention something very curious and very interesting about deep image priors. Who here has heard the term deep image prior? Quite a bit of people, but it's a very interesting thing. So neural networks, right, we see or experimentally we can observe their excellent performance in many tasks related nowadays to image reconstruction, including when you make end-to-end -end mapping and you train things. Okay, the question is, does it come from only learning or does it come from their structure? And we've heard several evidence even in this conference, right, about the fact that it actually sometimes comes from the structure rather than only from training. And the deep image prior paper was one form of uh, verification of this concept and it starts out with very simple and elegant experiment, which you can see here. So if I have a deep convolutional neural network and they have a particular architecture in the paper and they use several architectures, let's say I wanna fit it to something. So what, I, what does this mean? I have an image, I have a neural network, a single image, a neural network, and I regress the values of the weights. So I train the weights to fit the network to a single image. We know it's gonna overfit, okay? It's gonna overfit completely. But we're gonna try four different images. So it's not we, it's Uliana Fetal who did try four different images. So the first image, you take a clean image, just image without noise, you regress it to neural network. So then you're gonna see the convergence behavior, okay? Then you're gonna try image plus noise, image, but where all the pixels were shuffled randomly. And finally, random noise, uniform random noise between zero and one. Okay, now if you can look at this thing, you're gonna very quickly no notice one thing, that it's easier or faster to fit an image than to fit the noise, okay? So dynamics matter. So the neural network first overfits the image and it then overfits to the noise. And this is really the central argument. Now if we think about it, so why is it the case, it probably is related to the fact that, this is my hypothesis, is that the uh, convolutional neural network is convolutional, which means it's locally pooling the information. Now if you have completely shuffled image, there is no such structure, so it's much harder to overfit that thing, okay? So in the papers, the idea was, okay, can we use neural network without any training as a prior, okay? So what did they do? So they said the following, I have convolutional neural network F, which is non-linear, there is theta, which it's weights, the parameters of the neural network. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take y, which are my measurements, there's an operator, a measurement operator h, and we're gonna regress or optimize theta for a single set of measurements, okay? There's no training data set, it's set of measurements, we're gonna regress the neural network. So if we do, and at the end of the day, what we're gonna do, we're gonna find the theta star and form the image with the theta star. Now, if you look at the previous image before, you need an early stopping, so we're gonna do that. So there's an early stopping somewhere because we're gonna first fit to the image and then fit to the noise, okay? It's a combination of early stopping, and basically if you run this thing, you're gonna obtain a simple algorithm for regularizing images without anything except the structure of a neural network. And what you're fitting here to Z, Z is actually a fixed random noise. You're really fitting to random noise. So here you can see the, a clean image. You take a, you'd fit it to the, I think a blurred version of it. And then if you look at the iterations, you're gonna actually at some moment get a nice clean image that you can use as a regularizer, okay? So that's a really the idea of deep image prior. And they have a lot of evidence in the paper. You can really look. So here is a nice comparison between uh, you know, super resolution network which was trained and, you know, deep image prior, which is not trained and they get, you know, very good performance. So this was, you know, they really demonstrated some performances. So here's a simple experiment um, we did and I think it's very intriguing and I wanted to use this forum to bring this up. 
Okay. So what happened? Did I hear something? No. Okay, good. So I'm sorry I didn't know about that, but it's a simple experiment. Um, so let's say you, you know, add the other regularizers. What happens? Okay. So neural network structure, basically, we can think it restricts the evolution of the images, right? And we can still use it combined with other regularizers. So, so I can add a total variation. I can add another a regularizer inside the image formation. So what happens? So I mean, this is a network that we used. It's the same network which was in the original paper. It's a modified version of UNet, where you don't have any more a direct connection between features. There is a skip connection. Um, so we're gonna just take the same thing. Only change we did is really add this, this regularizer. Now let's look at the performance, which is very interesting. So here's a, a one illustration of a deep image prior with total variation, without total variation. Okay, you can see here, so there are two things you can see. In this case, one thing, total variation imposes additional restrictions to the set of images, okay? It stops uh, further the overfitting of the image, okay? And the second thing which is interesting is here, deep image prior with total variation is much better than both total variation and deep image prior, which is a very interesting conclusion. If I use each one separately, it's gonna be worse than using the combination. So there is some kind of interaction happening between these two priors, and we did uh, quite a bit of experimentation in this. You can really look for a problem, several pro inverse problems in this paper, but at least this was an intriguing, and you can see it even ends up being quite competitive with state-of-the-art methods like BM3D, both for color images and non-color images. So here's another thing. So this was actually for the problem of uh, the blurring, color the blurring, so you can see there is a IRCNN, which is actually a trained neural network, and then this one is uh, untrained, but with TV, which um, imposes this additional structure. So this is something I just wanted to bring up because I find it very intriguing and very related to the concept of using priors coming from ConvNets. So they can be priors because of training, but seems like also without training which is a very interesting phenomenon. So I think at this moment I can start slowly wrapping up this thing and uh, be quite open to the questions. So the first thing I mentioned is about optical tomography. I told about advantages, disadvantages. We talked about linear version, nonlinear version. We formulated an inverse problem with minimization. Uh, I discussed how to use plug and play framework for forming images, in particular how to accelerate it by taking partial gradients, and we gave a version of analysis of that under some conditions. And finally, there was a curious result of using uh, deep convolutional networks for uh, regularizing inverse problems, which I thought would be interesting to this audience. Okay, so I would like to thank of all the collaborators and also uh, my lab, which is uh, um, my PhD students are here and some interns here. Uh, you can find more information in the papers and this project was sponsored by both uh, NSF and NIH grant, uh, which was obtained through ICTC at WashU. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, you look back for this fascinating talk. I'm sure there are questions. Well, I have a little question myself. If you, you would try with different types of images, you tried natural images with TV prior, where uh, you could have uh, other types of images with yeah. another type of prior and see whether it's uh, I, indeed, you, you uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You're completely right. So uh, let, uh, actually, let me highlight the message. So the plug and play here, the one I was talking, I, I wasn't propagating one prior versus the other. So there are different priors. All I'm saying is there might be benefit of using priors beyond proximal. Yeah, yeah, so, no, and then to you test can, whether it's Which uh, one is good really and you can tailor it to your data and, the, and the, use the, it. It's prior than yeah. the, the, the structure so that the, If it was a piecewise yeah. constant, mm. maybe TV would be much better. Okay, so if there are no more questions, thank you again and... Uh, thank you. Okay.